ಗಂಗನಾಧಿಪತೇ ನಮಃ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಟುಡೇ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಸ್ಪೆಷಲ್ ಡೇ ಫುಲ್ ಮೂನ್ ಡೇ ಪೂರ್ಣಿಮ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಕೈಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಬಿಸಿ ಹಿಯರ್ ದೇ ಮೈ ಬಿ ಸಮ್ ಟ್ರಾಫಿಕ್ ನೋಯ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ರೌಂಡ್ ಬಟ್ ಡೋಂಟ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಇಸ್ ಔಟ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಅರೌಂಡ್ ದ ಹಿಲ್ ಸೊ here we come to a doubt and murugana expresses this doubt very nicely in the verse if it is thus said that this world is a mere play of thoughts why even when the mind is quiet does the world seem like a dream suddenly appear in front of us that is due to the stored momentum of past imaginations huh everybody's had this happen to them you sit down and you try to meditate and all of a sudden you're thinking about something your your aunt isabel said when you were 10 years old and you know or something else that happened or might happen or that you want to happen or don't want to happen the mind is uh, a machine a computer like thing designed to protect us to protect the body especially so it stores everything that happens in a kind of a blockchain database uh depending on the content depending on the subject like an index like a search engine or something like that so that whenever anything comes up it can go back in its memory and say oh this is similar to that other thing that happened huh and then what happened after that <laughs> so it's trying to anticipate any kind of trouble or harm that might come to the organism isn't it it's a beautiful machine of course we mess it up but anyway <laughs> the mind is going all the time monitoring everything you cannot stop the mind try it <laughs> go ahead i'll i'll wait <laughs> it only takes 2 seconds to try to stop the mind and realize that the mind is not going to stop so we can't destroy the mind uh, because the mind is really part of what is it's part of what god has made us so how do we handle it how do we deal with it well you know this whole series we've been talking about these four stages or four levels of the vedic teaching and so i'm going to go through them again and uh take a look at uh, i made this little diagrams now they're cheesy okay <laughs> i'm warning you <laughs> i don't have proper design tools or anything just an ipad so <laughs> the diagrams the design is a little cheesy but i think the the uh, principle or the metaphor embedded in them is sound actually they're called siddhantas a siddhanta is a final conclusion okay after going through all the vedas that's like they call vedanta right and anta means the end or the ultimate or the final uh conception or conclusion of a body of thought that's called a siddhanta and then the teaching and practice based on it is called the vada vada is a view and if you have this view then whatever you do is going to be according to that view so there are four views remember we went over them <laughs> a million times again but i'm going to put it up again okay the four views are dvaita vada vishishta dvaita vada vivarta vada and ajatta vada okay so let's take a look and what's in dvaita vada uh, we're not even going to talk about the pashus <laughs> we don't care about them but we want to talk to the sadhus 
we want to talk to the uh, people who are on the path. Okay, the path begins here. Dvaita Vada. First of all, we make a distinction between self and not self. And basically, the consciousness, the mind, and the body are the self. And the world is not self. Huh? And what's more, we have our viewpoint. See the big eye on the body. We're looking at things from the viewpoint of the body in Dvaita Vada. It's body consciousness, body-based identity. Okay, so when we look at things, then the mind comes up with these memories. These are technically called vasanas. And a vasana is simply a, a mental image recording of a past incident or event, or, and it can contain any kind of crazy stuff, mostly uh, pain, negative emotion, and unconsciousness. Nice, huh? <laughs> so these things pop up whenever we see something that reminds us of those past incidents which is basically all the time <laughs> because, because some of the qualities of all those incidents are going to be involved in the present moment, like individual existence, having a mind, senses, body, and so on and so forth, uh, having an identity and trying to make it in the world, uh, that whole struggle, survival, and all that kind of stuff. That's all we're down there in Dvaita Vada, <laughs> okay? psychology and all that kind of stuff. And uh, Dvaita Vadis work very hard in the world according to the instructions of scriptures, religion, morality, ethics, integrity, all these kind of things, plus a systematic program of sacrifice, religious sacrifice, karma yoga. Remember? Huh? The Dvaita Vadis practice karma yoga. And they do it from the viewpoint of the body. And if they're successful, they graduate to the next stage, which is called Vishishta Dvaita Vada. Vishishta Dvaita Vada, the concept of self now changes. And it becomes only the consciousness and the mind. And the point of view is from the mind. See the big eye there in the mind. And not self is the body and the world. Huh? The realization of real religion is that I am not the body. Well, if I'm not the body, I'm not the senses. And I'm not this, if I'm not the senses, I'm definitely not the world that the senses show. So what am I? Well, I'm my mind. <laughs> Mainly I'm my mind. I am what I think. Huh? I think, therefore I am. Descartes. So this is the platform of, I would say, uh, the real religion, bhakti, love of God. Okay, One graduates from karma yoga by accumulating a, a, a sufficient amount, like a bank balance, of pious karma. And that will support the next stage of consciousness, development of consciousness, bhakti, or love of God. Okay. So when bhakti develops, then it turns into vivartavada. And then in vivartavada, we realize that actually uh, we know we are the self, and we view the world from the point of view of consciousness. Okay. We view everything... Uh, as a consciousness, not as a mind anymore. Mind, body, and world are part of not-self in this view. And that's why it's called vivartavada. Vivarta means an appearance. So in this view, we take the world, the not-self part of reality, and we call it, right, we call it an appearance. An appearance means something that looks like it exists, but it doesn't really, like the mirage in the desert. Huh? It looks like water, but if you go over to it, it's not even there. So you can't use it as water. 
So in the same way, the world appears to be a place where we can really exist. But actually it isn't. It's like the mirage in the desert. If we try to exist there, then we find we have problems. Why? Because we take the world as real. But in Vivartavana, once we realize actually the world is not real, the process becomes then Raja Yoga, Neti Neti, rejecting this, that, everything, whatever, all concepts ultimately and coming to the pure conceptless self. And that's the final stage, Ajatavada. And in Ajatavada, <laughs> it's so paradoxical, I love it. The mind, body, and world are seen as part of the self again. Now even the world is seen as self, but not the same self as <laughs> in Dvaitavada. In Dvaitavada, the self is based on the body and consists of the ego and its attachments. Okay? But in Ajatavada, the view is that all this stuff doesn't even exist, man. It's just an appearance on the screen of consciousness. So what we've been doing here in Guru Vachaka Kovai is going back and forth from Vivartavada to Ajatavada. And why? Why? Well, okay, now things get a little complicated. Uh, you kids might want to tune out right now and then go to bed. Now, this is for adults, okay? We're going to talk about computer security. Computer security is a very important concept called sandboxing. And basically what it is, is if you're in a threat environment, you know, like the internet, <laughs> you can't trust anything. So your browser lives and runs in what virtual machine, okay? A virtual machine is a program that to your browser looks like a computer, but it's not a computer, it's a simulation. <laughs> in software. And then uh, you can have a bunch of these things, you know, one uh, for each separate page you have open or whatever, or connection or whatever. And then there's another program called a hypervisor that exists in protected memory that runs all these other programs. It's really cool. Okay. Well, what are we doing actually? We're abstracting the, the computer hardware to protect it from these programs or web pages or whatever that we don't trust. They can't do anything that would be harmful uh, because in our model of, of the computer, it just you know doesn't exist. They can't reach it. It's not there for them. Only the things we want them to be able to do can be reached. Huh? And, uh, that's a very important technique in computer security. So what are we doing when we change our view? Is that in the beginning what we're doing is sandboxing or isolating, protecting the parts of reality that lead us away from self. You know, just like the internet is dangerous because there's a bunch of bad actors and trolls and all whatever out there. So we want to insulate ourselves. We want to isolate that part of the internet so it can't hurt our computer in any way. In the same way, we want to isolate the mind in the beginning from the world. And then eventually we want to isolate the consciousness even from the mind. Isn't it? The second jhana in Buddhism is the silence of the mind. And of course, Ramana mentions it from the beginning. Uh, and this is really the key to the ajatta stage, this practice, the practice that leads to its realization, is to practice silencing the mind. How do you silence the mind? The mind is like a monkey chattering all day and night. How do you silence it? Well, you just have to look away from it. 
to the self. Uh, and then we talk about um, the light. Okay, the light. Uh, the light, of course, is the self, our self, illuminating the world for us to be conscious of it, if we want to be. Uh, we don't have to be. <laughs> but when we take a body, you know, we sign up for a term of karmic uh, bondage, basically, <laughs> attachment based on the body and based on the thought, I am the body. So when we become advanced on this path of sadhana, we start to see that all these things are simply thoughts. There's no way actually that we can verify that the world is real, that the mind is real, that logic and reason and so on lead to correct conclusions. They don't, <laughs> they always have to be tested. So the mind can't be trusted. It's just a semantic reasoning machine. It's just software, you know. <laughs> so it can't be trusted. It's always going to make mistakes. So only consciousness is real. And even of consciousness, only the awareness part is real. <laughs> the content is not real. Anything that you can perceive is relative to your consciousness. Uh, it's an object, and you're a subject. So that duality means it's not real. Not in the sense that Brahman is real. Not in the sense that awareness is real. Awareness is like the bedrock, you know. Just the Brahman is described in the Ribu Gita as a solid block of consciousness, infinite in extent. I mean... <laughs> You know, those pictures of what's his name, uh, Robert uh, Robert Smith or something, you know? always looks like he's on acid and he's looking into the infinite void, you know. <laughs> okay, yeah, you can do that. That's a fun game to play. But that's going on at the same time as the world is going on. So if we still have prarabdha karma, if our body is still in the world, we do, we do have some responsibility to act in the world, but not to be attached, not to be uh, taken in by the illusion, not to consider that the mirage is real. And that's what he's trying to tell us here. Aum tat sat. Aum harihi aum. 